And uh, so what I thought I would do, first of all, thanks for coming. Um, if you're interested in connecting to the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, I think you know how to do that. Just go to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, our guide, your whole drill. You can look me up on LinkedIn, and if you want to connect, I'd be happy to connect and kind of connect you to our chapter network if you're interested in creating a chapter or doing, helping us do what we do and advance our mission which incidentally is helping you get your ideas to patients, then we're happy to do that. So I thought what I would do is um, uh, go through some lessons learned and battle scars and stuff that I've learned over the course of several years getting involved in this area of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, um, so here's just some tips. Um, it, and these are just my views, you know, battle scars, big mistakes, stuff I would recommend you not do. Um, uh, innovation starts with mindset. So the first question you need to ask yourself is, if you want to get into this game, do you have an entrepreneurial mindset? My view is about 1% of scientists, engineers, and health professionals have an entrepreneurial mindset. And it's not your fault. It's the fault of the system because you don't get selected to go to medical school, graduate school, or nursing school because you're a, an imaginative, creative genius. <laughs> you get in like I got in because I could memorize a bunch of stuff, do well on a standardized test, and tell the interviewer exactly what they wanted to hear. They didn't know what the hell they were asking me. I didn't know what to say. But you just do the mimicking language, and you do it eight or 10 times throughout the, ro the rotation, interviewing, spending $4,000 worthlessly to do that. And then you get selected if you're lucky. And of course, you have to check off all the boxes. Build a school in Guatemala, pass organic chemistry, <laughs> you know, get, get a gold medal for cross-country skiing, all the stuff you have to do to get into medical school, which is really stupid. So I'm sorry. If you don't have an entrepreneurial mindset, get over it. Now, you can, the good news is your personality cannot change. It's fixed by the time you're 14 or 15. Your mindset can change. So if you are interested in doing this, you can change your mindset. Mindset means how you see the world, how your thoughts drive your emotions, how your emotions drive your behavior. So if you're not thinking like or seeing the world as an entrepreneur, that's OK. So you have a choice. You know the decision algorithm? See 40 patients a day for the rest of your life and knock yourself out. Or change your mindset and do something different and take control. So good for you. You're here to try to make a difference. But do yourself and me a favor. If you don't have what it takes, don't do it. If you decide you want to do it, great. But don't knock yourself out. It's, it, you know, we're all built different ways. We have strengths and weaknesses. But you have to have the mindset. Okay? And we can teach you how to do that. Second, in my mind, leaderpreneurs, and I think the, one of the problems that we have in the system is we're fixated on managing innovation. This is not about managing innovation. It's about leading innovators like you. This is a people deal. This is not a system deal. And if you don't know how to lead, let alone lead innovators, innovators are a pain in the ass. They throw grenades. They poke fingers in your eyes. They cause trouble. They're dis so-called disruptive. You know, it used to be, if you were a disruptive physician, you got this knock on the door from the, chair, the, the chief medical officer of where you work saying, you know, you threw something at a nurse in the OR. <laughs> and that's not good. And so don't do that anymore. So you're, you're now being labeled a disruptive physician. But we want you to be a disruptive physician because we need to innovate. Seriously? Like, so where does one end and the other begin? So it's not like you're being disruptive because you're causing patient harm, or you're causing all sorts of chaos in the clinic, or you're sexually assaulting somebody in the clinic. It's 
you're making a big mess and causing a lot of trouble in this organization because you want to change things. This is hard business, and you're not making friends doing this. You're going to take a lot of arrows in the back. You have to have thick skin. And oh, by the way, intrapreneurship, employed physicians or health professionals trying to add user-defined value to their organization as an employee is harder than technopreneurship. Why? Because you got to deal with all the Michigas getting an idea to a patient and you have to avoid the corporate immune system that is looking to squash you like a grape. So it's, it's just really hard to do both. We need leaderpreneurs. We need managers. That's why I have this thing about MDA programs. I have one. I created one. I teach people in them. And you know what? I sort of regret it. Because we need more managers like a hole in the head. I'm sorry. If you want to be the VP for medical affairs because you're sick of seeing patients and you want to continue making 800000 as an orthopedic surgeon in a C-suite, knock yourself out. But we really don't need more managers. We need more leaders who lead entre innovators, not manage entrepreneurship systems. So figure out how to do that. You, it's a different skill set. And again, these are all things that you're going to have to learn how to do to get from A to B, or just don't do it. Okay? It's like you decide you want to be an ENT doctor, like me. So you, go, you sign up for an ENT residency, and a year into the residency, you say, this is ridiculous. I don't like this. I want to be a psychiatrist. <laughs> OK, great. Save me the brain damage of having to fill the slot in your fourth year. Just bail. Figure something else out. Entrepreneurship is oftentimes seen as a crime. It's a crime against the system. And like any crime, if you want to commit the crime, you're going to have to do the time. In other words, you got to show up. You can't just say you're going to do it. The biggest problem I have are people who put a hand up but don't show up. You'll, you'll run into those folks every now and then. And it's a lot of work and time and effort. And if you do not have the wherewithal or the emotional fortitude to do this, then don't do it. And like any crime, it takes means, motive, and opportunity. So the means is, do you have what it takes? So my view, about 15% of entrepreneurship is nature. I think people are just fundamentally built to do this probably about 15% of the formula. I'm just making these numbers up, but that's the back of the envelope. And then there's an 85% where you can actually learn stuff. Mindset, skills, knowledge, attitudes, competencies, et cetera, et cetera. In this crowd, we call it clinical judgment. You make mistakes because you had experience, so you develop judgment. It's the same thing in business. It's the same thing working with companies. And if you don't go out and work with companies, it's like reading the book and not going to the bedside. It's like the old Osler thing, right? So you got to see patients if you're going to be a doctor. And if you're going to be a doctor, you're going to make mistakes and develop clinical judgment. It's the same thing in entrepreneurship. You got to go out there and get your hands dirty. You got to go to the bedside. You got to examine people. You got to make mistakes. That's how you develop business judgment, OK? So it starts with means. Then you got to have a motive. Why are you doing this? This is hard work. This is really hard work. And it's emotionally taxing. So what I say is, you got to make it personal, but don't take it personally. In other words, if you look at entrepreneurs that are drop dead, they have something inside of them, including me, which you might hear in my voice, as I said yesterday. Don't mistake what I'm doing as passion for anger. <laughs> I'm pissed off, right? I'm, and so are you. I'm not taking it anymore. They stole my profession. 
What happened to the tribe? Where did it all go? I didn't train. Rah, 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 rah. I didn't train for all these years, you know, the usual stuff. OK, good for you. Take control. But if you do not have something that is personally driving you to do this, and I can tell you the story what drives me, to make a long story short, one, deep-seated psychic pathology, <laughs> which is a very long story, <laughs> which I won't go into because I'm a very unempathic surgeon. And secondly, um, um, there has to be something that this just trips your trigger. And, if, and there's this little, vo and you will fail. I guarantee you, you will fail doing this. Your success will depend on the number of shots you take on goal. That's it. You just have to keep doing it. It's a numbers game. It's like dating. You just have to keep doing it until you find what trips your trigger and it works. Okay? But you will fail, so you do not want to take the failure personally. It's part of the game. If you do not have complications in the operating room, if you do not have patients who have mortality, you are not doing enough surgery. Same deal. So make it personal. Figure out what that is. I don't care whether it's a kid with a rare disease that nobody has been able to figure out, or whether you are so fed. If I see another clipboard, I'm going to scream a process, or a business model. I mean, we've all had a horrible patient experience as patients. We've all had horrible patient experiences. We don't need to go into, after three days of burnout talks, about what we're doing. So make it personal, but don't take it personally. And this is the hard one, because we all have our demons and parents. You know, it's just all the stuff. I mean, shit happens. So deal with it, and if that's what's driving you to fix the system, great. Knock yourself out but I would really get into the core and figure out why you are doing this. Because I'm telling you, if you go down this road, you're making a major commitment to your family, to your income, to your mental health, to your time, to your trade-offs, all that stuff. It's really hard. OK. You want to be, at this stage of the game, a problem seeker, not a problem solver. You do not want to create shiny new objects. You've heard all this before. Solutions, looking for a problem. You want to get into the head of your customer. A, you have to figure out who your customer is, and that's hard in sick care because there are multiple stakeholders, and you've got to satisfy all of them with value propositions to get anywhere. So you have to figure out who the customer is. But spend your time understanding the problem. Design thinking, customer discovery, business model canvas, lean startup methodology, minimal viable product, blah, 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 blah. But get into the head of the customer, whether it's creating an archetype and a persona. But remember, as was discussed this morning, all of us in this room buy emotionally and justify rationally. Behavioral economics. I can't believe a guy got a Nobel Prize for figuring that out. <laughs> really? I, you knew that. How come you didn't get a Nobel Prize for that? Right? So get to the emotional part. And, and when you're crafting a value, and it was discussed this morning, when you're, when you're crafting a value proposition, for example, for a doctor, I talked about workflow and income. But generally, I say you're going to have to create what I call a quilt set. Quality, workflow, what's in it for me? How do you reduce my liability? How do you increase my time, typically, to spend with a patient? And the set is, how does your, pro your solution provide a social, emotional, and technical solution to my problem? Now, the social and the emotional solution is buried. And if you talk to a doctor and say, what's your problem? And they'll tell you, I want to make more money, and I'm burned out. 
It really is not, or they'll, you come and they say, well, show me the data. That's a smoke screen. It's the price of entry because they don't know what else to say and they don't want to admit to the fact that they're embarrassed that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing in front of their peers because they're not keeping up with what the hell's going on in their field. So you have to really dig deep to get down into the social and emotional drivers of the problem. And if you find that you do not have a solution for the problem or your solution is the wrong answer to that problem, move on. Do something different. Figure it out, okay? But don't keep beating us on the head with you know, stuff that doesn't really work. Okay, you gotta pick your spot. In this world of entrepreneurship, we had a workshop last, yesterday about being a CMO or an advisor. You really have to sort of decide where do you wanna play in this game? So I call it roles, holes, and goals. So what, what role do you wanna play? Do you wanna be a CMO? Do you wanna be an advisor? Do you wanna be a startup founder? Do you wanna be just somebody that's kind of an offhand advisor? Et cetera, et cetera. What, how much, you wanna do a side gig? Do you wanna do it temporarily? Do you wanna make it 40%? That stuff. What role do you want to play in which part of this industry? Fundamentally, entrepreneurship is about drugs, devices, in, in vitro diagnostics, digital health care delivery, medical education technology, a little bit of fintech, insurance tech, and then other stuff, which I would just call policy innovation. So there are various places that you can play you have to make that decision because the roadmap, the innovation roadmap for drug discovery and development is very different than care delivery, innovation, process, platform, models, infrastructure, ecosystems, all that stuff is different for each one of those silos. So if you decide you want to play in medical device, great, but you have to understand medical device. It's not the same as digital health. It's certainly not the same as a care delivery prop. You know, so you're, you're in reference to the last talk, if you're developing a remote patient monitoring platform, that's a whole lot different than getting a drug to market. So you've got to figure out where you want to play. So that's the roles. The holes are, what problem are you trying to solve? It starts with, who's the customer? What's their problem? How much pain is it causing? How do you intend to solve it? So you have to figure out the problem in that specific industry playing a specific role. To narrow, because the universe is just too big. You can't boil the ocean. You've got to figure out where you want to play. You've got to pick your spot. And then it gets to goals. What are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to just make a lot of money and finance a company? and scale it as quickly as possible and get enough eyeballs in front of the screen so some private equity person can buy it? Or are you actually trying to help patients? Now, I'm trying, I'm assuming, actually I'm not assuming anything. I'm assuming there are people in this room that just want to make a lot of money. Okay, but I kind of think you're in the wrong room, at least from my view. So we're here to try to fix the damn thing and recover the profession and empower you to make a change. And I also would tell you that I left out the social entrepreneurs. So you could be a, a technopreneur, you could be a social entrepreneur, you could be a edu, an edupreneur, like I am, like an academic educational entrepreneur. You could be a social entrepreneur where basically you're trying to change the human condition. Cure, Af cure malaria in Africa. Set up a nonprofit innovation and entrepreneurship network so we can do this to scale what we're trying to do. So figure out where you want to play. There's lots of ways to skin this cat. Obviously, you have to understand the ecosystem and the lay of the land. If you are a non-sick care entrepreneur, in other words, you're a techie, and you sold 18 bazillion pairs of shoes and we're able to apply seven houses around the world as a result of doing it, and you say to yourself, what's the big deal? I created a website. I made a gazillion dollars selling, I can fix sick care. Really? 
So you really have to understand, I don't know to tell you guys, this is complicated business. Who would have thought healthcare could be so complicated? <laughs> and so you have, but most folks don't get that. <laughs> That's why they hire you. Explain the sick care system to me. Really? How much time do you have? So you got to understand the lay of the land. And in reference to the previous talk about building a whole product solution, more and more we are in what's called an ecosystem economy. And unless you put together the pieces that create an ecosystem, it's unlikely your drop dead technology will work. Best examples, television. The guy who invented television, you can't name the guy who invented the television. But you probably know Robert Sarnoff who created CBS. Why did television work? Because there was a network. But the network didn't happen until 12 years after the invention of the television. What about electric cars? The electric car will happen. It is happening. But it's not going to scale until there is an electric grid so that you don't run out of electricity in the middle of I-70. You need an ecosystem. I call this the one fax phenomenon. It doesn't do you any good to invent a fax machine if there's just one. And that's, in a lot of respects, that's where we are now in digital health. We got all these silos and one-offs and nothing's connected and you hold all the, heard all the stuff. So it doesn't help. You need an ecosystem to build a whole product solution. Um, you're going to have to go through a process of what I call fail it, nail it, scale it, and sail it. In other words, you come up with an idea, you go through a million iterations, none of them work, you finally figure out something that gets traction, so you fail it. Then you finally come up with an idea and you nail it. It's working. You have a first customer. But as you heard before, the second customer is harder than the first because now you've got to cross the chasm, et cetera, et cetera. Then, if you decide to scale it, keep the end in mind. What's the exit? Why are you doing this? How do you know you've succeeded? So you're going to have to go through these various steps. Um, fill the skill positions in a startup or any other enterprise and fill it with people that you know, like, and trust. Fill it with people that are diverse. Fill it with people who have not just diversity in the color of their skin, but in their functional areas and in their psychographics. You need diversity of thought, not just different faces around the table. And oh, by the way, there's a difference between equity, diversity, and inclusion. Equity is ownership of the outcome. Diversity is demographic variation. Inclusion, you actually are listening to what I'm saying. So, you know, it's a whole other subject of diversity and inclusion, but if you fill a table, you know, if you fill a boardroom with a bunch of folks that are black, green, black, you know, purple, whatever, and you don't pay any attention to them, then what the hell good is it? So inform your team with diversity and fill the skill positions. And typically in a startup, the skill positions are going to be a prop, and very few people have all this skill set. You have to have a problem seeker, somebody who's really good at, mark, at understanding design thinking, a problem solver, usually a techie, a business builder, a money finder, and a storyteller. Now, very few of you are really good storytellers, but Building a company and getting a product is about telling stories. It's not selling shit to doctors. Okay? So you, you have to have somebody who understands that. That's why in the STEAM, the STEM conversation, um, science, technology, engine, you know, so now the A, STEAM, is the uh, humanities, actually it's STEAM, humanities, technology, engine. You need arts, creatives, you need people that know how to tell stories to scale your company and create buzz on social media before you raise money. You gotta tell the story. You gotta get people interested. You gotta, you gotta say, so what? 
Why should I care about what you're doing? And that's about telling stories. Innovation is not a roadmap. I wrote a book called the Life Science Innovation Roadmap. And it basically walks you through the steps of how to get an idea to a patient. I subsequently realized it was a bad title because after I had done it for a while, it's not a roadmap. You don't get a piece of paper that says, go from here to here and then make a right turn and go from here to here and get off at this exit. And it's more like a treasure hunt and you get clues, but you actually really don't know where to go. So you talk to a customer, they tell you something. You get a clue. Actually, they're really not telling you the truth. Because what do they know what they want? Or you, you form a focus group, it was really stupid. So you're just gonna have to sense the clue. So you are a pioneer. You're an explorer, right? It's not a roadmap. So be sensitive to the clues. Change in the environment, SWOT analysis, change in technology, change in geopolitics, change, 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 change. Be sensitive to the environment and have a mechanism to respond. Um, in terms of what, so in terms of the mindset and what are the things that drive most entrepreneurs? Long story short, these are them. Really good entrepreneurs do this. They connect. They experiment, which is, should be secondhand to docs. They observe. They see things other people don't. They question why, why not, what if, suppose. And they associate. They connect the dots. And if you look at a large segment of entrepreneurs, arguably in retrospect, and arguably it came to Harvard, but who cares? The these are the main things that you should work on. So the next time I hear someone in this room say, I say, well, let's connect on LinkedIn. And the person says, I don't do LinkedIn. <laughs> really? Why? I don't want to be bothered. You know, I got enough stuff in my life. I think you're in the wrong conference. <laughs> Actually, LinkedIn is down the street. <laughs> so maybe you ought to go pay, that, pay them a visit. All right. So that's what you need to work on. And if you're interested, this book is called The Innovator's DNA, Clayton Christensen, Harvard Business School, if you're interested in reading it. Know when to pull the plug. There is nothing sinful about admitting failure. You'll save yourself and everybody around you and your dog a lot of heartburn if you just quit, because the dog's getting tired of getting kicked. Just quit. Know when to say no. Know when to hang it up. But if you do not learn something from the failure, you have just wasted an enormous amount of your life. So, what differentiates people that learn from don't? They take personal responsibility for their failure. Stop blaming the system. It's your fault. People like me got us into this problem. Why would you expect me to get us out of it? I'm sorry, you're the problem but you're also the solution if you recognize it. If you don't, you've just wasted an enormous amount of time. Practicing around corners, that's a real skill, which means you have to have a sense of the environment, sensing it and responding to it appropriately. And there's a bunch of ways to do every one of these things. Never work for people you don't trust, ever, 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 ever. Sooner or later, you're gonna pay for it. Unfortunately, the, the medical establishment, and, and I, I include myself amongst these, medical educators and the medical education establishment have craniorectal inversion syndrome. <laughs> Their heads are in the place where the sun don't shine, and they're fine with that. It's educational malpractice. We need to change how we select, train, advance, recruit, and graduate medical students, and we need to create entrepreneurial medical schools. Think big, start small. Don't ask for money until you have your first customer. I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense. You know, the, the, the ultimate validation of your idea is someone willing to buy it. Don't get distracted. I call it the distraction of traction. You start getting involved with everything, and oh, maybe we ought to do this, and maybe we ought to do that, and maybe we ought to do that. No, focus. 
get your first customer, start establishing some revenue, and then maybe you can start putting more balls on the Christmas tree. If you're looking for money, there's this old truism that the money goes to the TAM and the team. TAM is total, total addressable market, and the team is who's on the team and have they demonstrated or will they demonstrate an ability to pivot? Because things are going to go wrong. It's like you hire the anesthesiologist, the gas passer, to put the patient asleep and wake them up. Everything that happens in between, they're reading the Wall Street Journal. Right? Or airline pilots. You pay them to take off and land. Everything else is on autopilot. So ultimately, you're going to have to hire people that know how to respond to stressful situations and can pivot. And actually, there's a lot of stuff coming out now about traction. There's actually a new book about traction, like how do you scale an enterprise, different topic altogether, and how long is all this going to take, and are you still going to be alive to realize any benefit from it? Thank you. All right.